Hi, so I just passed the patent bar last Friday, super exciting, and I figured that I would make a video on how I passed the patent bar because this was my third time taking it. I had failed it twice before, and each time that I took it, I sort of tried a different approach. So I thought it might be helpful, since I didn't really know what to do, to share what worked for me. So maybe people who are in the same boat can use my strategy and pass the patent bar. So the first time I took the patent bar, so with this video, I'm assuming that you guys know how to you know, sign up for the patent bar, what the requirements are, and if not, let me know, and I can do a separate video on how to do all that, but this video will solely be for how I pass the patent bar. Anyways, so the first time I took the patent bar was in 2019. It was before I started law school, and I used PLI. I had watched <laughs> maybe 20% of their videos, and I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be an open book exam. It can't be that hard. You know, it's open book. You can use control F. It's fine. I don't need to try that hard. I don't need to really study that hard, put in that much effort. So I didn't, and I I went and took the exam after not really studying and just relying on the fact that it's open book. I got in, I tried sort of control F, but my timing was all off. I had no idea where things were in each of the chapters. It was a mess. I ended up getting like 37% really, really far from passing. And then I started law school. And I got through my first two years, and that's when I really started to miss science, I guess. So I was like, okay, I do want to spend the rest of my life, you know, mixing science and the law. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take the patent bar again. So in August of 2022, I decided that I was going to take the patent bar again. The cool thing about PLI is that if you don't pass, you can just renew your course. So I emailed them and I said, hey, I didn't pass. Can you please renew my course? They renewed my course. I think if you want new books, you have to pay like 250 or something for an updated binder. But I just used my binder from 2019 and it was fine. And also on the PLI website, they'll post updates in like the law or if any of the procedures or rules change, then they'll post updates on their website. So you can see if something, something significant changed. So I used my 2019 binder and I used the updated PLI course and I watched all the videos this time for my second attempt. I watched all the videos, I read the binder, like each chapter as you were supposed to read the chapter first, then watch the videos and then take notes. And I wrote like a law school version outline of each topic, the PLI chapters. I did all the quizzes at the end of each chapter. And then after I finished all of that, I went to the post course and I did some of the practice questions and I did each of the USPTO's practice exams, so the three that they have posted on their website, but which are also on PLI's, you know, practice questions section. And I was scoring, I think like high 60s to mid to low 70s, but I was relying very heavily on PLI's advice, which was memorize the basics and as much else as you can, and then use the MPEP very minimally. 
during the exam. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to memorize, I think, all 300 of the USPTO's practice exam questions. I tried to memorize as much as I could practice question wise and just like very had a very surface level knowledge of the MPEP itself. And in November of 2022, so after wait, August, September, October, yeah, about three-ish months of studying alongside with school, doing all of that, I took it again, and I didn't pass. This time, I got a 64%. And what I noticed during the exam is that there were a lot of questions that were just seems so so out of left field that I hadn't had memorized just random little topics and another issue was that the MPEP that they provide during the exam is slow and there's so much more clicking that has to be done to get to where you want to be and it takes a few seconds to load it also is the PDF version of the MPEP. So after I failed, I went and looked at, I paid, I think it was like 220 or something dollars to go look at the questions that I got incorrect. And that I think was super helpful. And I, I wrote them down. Well, you can't bring any notes in, but I like memorized them and I wrote them all down afterwards, like which section they came from, how many I missed, and what specifically they were focused on. And what I noticed is that it, the questions are very, very dispersed throughout the MPEP. So what I was doing wrong was I focused so heavily on 700 and 2100 that I neglected all the other chapters of the MPEP. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna take it again and I'm gonna pass this next time. And the way I made sure of that was by not memorizing answers, by not re-watching the videos or rereading my outline, but by really learning the MPEP. And the way I did that was by only doing practice questions. So I would do, after I failed in November, I think I took a week off and then I started about like November 20th doing 25 practice questions every day. And then so Monday through Friday, I would do 25 practice questions, and then Saturday, I would do 50, Sunday, take the day off. And each practice question that I would do, I would look it up in the MPEP, or I would try to. And if I couldn't find it, I'd, I'd pull up the answer and see where they say it is in the MPEP, then I would go and find it. And I would do the same for questions I got wrong. I would go to the specific section that they said the question was in and find it verbatim in the MPEP. And so I did this and then mid-December, I upped the amount of questions I was doing to 50 questions a day. So I would do 50 questions a day, but sometimes it would be every other day because in December, I was on winter break and so I went to Taiwan and so t visiting family, it was kind of difficult to make sure I did the questions every day. So I started doing 50 questions every day or every other day. And then I would do a hundred question practice test each weekend in the three weeks leading up to my exam. And then during the week, I would repeat the half sections of the practice exam, but looking them up, like I wasn't, sorry, I wasn't trying to memorize them. I wasn't doing any of that. I was trying to get comfortable with the MPEP. And so all in all, my exam was January 13th, Friday the 13th. Yes. And I looked up 
I want to say 95% of the exam. I looked up almost every single question except for like, so in the first section, there was one left that I didn't get to, and so I just had to guess. And then in the second section, I think there were about five questions that I didn't have time to look up, and so I just did a read through and then just gave my best educated guess. And the cool thing is that I noticed, too, is as you spend more time in the MPP and as I did more questions, my intuition became more accurate. So when it came time to guess, or like if I didn't have enough time to actually answer a question and I had to guess, my guess would typically be correct just based on, I think, how many questions I did and my comfortability with the material. But I relied on the MPP very heavily. And when I was doing the practice questions, I wouldn't use the USPTO's nice MPP. I would go Google like MPP PDF and then find the most recent version and work with that because that is pretty much the exact same one that is used on the exam. And so I, yeah, I took the exam January 13th and I passed. So now I'm here to share the practice questions and looking up nearly every question, for sure every question you got wrong, but if you feel like you know the material well enough and you don't really need to look it up, I would still look it up just because I wanted to make sure I really knew where it was in the MPEP because the exam was harder. It definitely was harder than the practice tests posted by the USPTO or the questions provided by PLI. It most definitely was harder. I didn't think I would pass, but I do think that my understanding of the MPEP and where everything is facilitated me passing. <laughs> so I did about 1,100 questions. I've seen on Reddit that people said 400 questions, you'll be comfortable, six to 700, you'll know it. But I didn't want to take any chances. I didn't want to take this test again. So I did 1,100. And the USPTO practice exams do not entirely show up on the actual exam. However, there were some repeat questions. I would say in each section, there were about four repeat questions. I don't remember which exam specifically they were from, but I remember seeing them in previous exams. And if you don't have PLI, Honestly, I think you can learn it by just finding practice questions elsewhere and getting comfortable with the MPEP because I don't know how much I learned from the videos. Like, the videos are helpful and everyone learns differently, but I think the most helpful part of PLI were the amount of questions that you had at your fingertips. And so I've heard that Weissbridge, I think it's called, and Pat Bar also provide a decent amount of questions, but PLI, and I didn't use those, so I have no idea how they are. This is just what I've seen online. But PLI, I think mm, the most useful part of the course to me were the practice questions. But the USPTO past exam questions, you can just get those from the USPTO website. So if you don't have, you know, $2,000 to <laughs> fork out, it's, well, it's 1000 for students. So that's kind of cool. But I think there are other ways to do it. And it is doable. You just have to be consistent, stay motivated. <laughs> And don't lose hope. And I think that is everything.
So I have my notebook here to show you guys, I guess, if you're it matters or you can stop the video here but I have my notebook here to show like what I did at the end of my studies so when it went came down to I think a week before my exam I went through every MPEP chapter oh, backward, and I wrote like the most important parts of each chapter so typically what made something important to me is I've seen a question on it or it sounds like something that a question could be asked on. And so I'd write it, write it down just to help it go into memory a little bit. I also took notes on the affidavits. So 1.130, what that's used for, 1.131, and 1.132, what that's used for. You know, you can find that all in specific parts of the MPEP, but I wanted to write it so I had it in memory and it was a little quicker if I saw a question on it, but I actually didn't see, I think, a single question on on the affidavit stuff. That doesn't mean they don't exist, or that doesn't mean it won't be asked. I just, personally, on my exam, I didn't see a lot of affidavit stuff. I... I did see um, a lot of, there was a lot of PCT, so 1800, of course, patentability stuff, so 2100. There was pre-grant challenges, post-grant challenges. Oh, that was another thing I did. I So I wrote out all the different challenges that there are and when they happen like during issue prior to issue or post issue and if you guys are interested I can like scan my notes and share them somehow but if that gets traction I can figure that out but if it doesn't then whatever and so another tip was that I was getting comfortable with not just the big chapters, like 700, 1200, 1800, but all the chapters. Because as I had previously mentioned, each of the chapters are tested a little bit. So 2100, 700, 1800. I think 600 were tested pretty, pretty heavily, but like 200, 300, 500, 1100 third party submissions were definitely important to know. 2000, I think that's duty of disclosure. 2300, so like interferences, derivation stuff. 2500, and I think 2,900. So like all the questions are spread out all over the place. So don't just focus your efforts on three chapters because that's sort of what I did the second time I took it and that was not effective. So just know where, just get comfortable with all the chapters and you should be fine. <laughs> all right. Let me know if you guys have any questions.